My name is Emily de Rosenroll. I'm the CEO of the South Island Prosperity Partnership, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to introduce this next um, panel for you. So it's called the Green Recovery. How do we build back even better? And a very critical theme for us today um, as we go forward and build our economy back much better than before. So first of all, I'd like to thank our session sponsor, One Planet Initiative, um, that made this topic possible. Now I'd like to introduce you to your moderator, Bruce Williams the CEO of the Greater Victoria's Chamber of Commerce, a man that probably needs no introduction. He's very well known on Vancouver Island. He's a public figure and a former broadcaster. He's known for his integrity, altruism, and his unique ability to create successful partnerships like the South Island Prosperity Partnership. Thank you very much and over to you, Bruce. Emily, thanks very much. It's always great to be recognized and noticed for the right things. That always makes a difference. I would like to begin by acknowledging that I live and work on the ancestral territories of the uh, Coast Salish nations, in particular the Lekwungen speaking peoples of the Songhees and the Esquimalt. I would like at this point to introduce your panel to you. You've got a significant bio of all these folks uh, on the South Island website, so I'll just give you a brief introduction. John Cook is the president of Green Chip Financial Corporation. John is an investment management executive, an entrepreneur, and a registered portfolio manager. Nikki McDonald is the CEO of the Windsor Group, a global impact fund committed to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Nikki serves as the executive director of the Windsor Foundation, which promotes sustainability in water, energy, education, and air. Andrew Pape Salmon is a part time adjunct professor with the University of Victoria's Department of Civil Engineering. He's focused on research regarding ultra low energy buildings, along with being a provincial civil servant. Jill Doucette founded Synergy in 2008 after completing her studies in biology, and Jill is passionate about how business, industry, and communities can mobilize towards a low-carbon future. And Jamila Franco is the co-founder of Neoka Design Labs, a clean technology social enterprise focused on leveraging advances in sustainable biotechnology and material sciences to design regenerative, innovative products following the circular economy role. So we're going to go into a, a series of questions and discussions with our guests. Um, just as we get that started, though, I want to uh, go back to you, John Cook. The idea of, of green green investment is not an emerging thing, correct? I mean, that's that's been around even pre-COVID. Yeah, absolutely. We've been doing this for 14 years and lots of competitors, so absolutely. And what's the appetite for it? Like, why do people get into this, aside from it being good for the planet? What, what do they see as the opportunity? Yeah, I think uh, I think there's a real range. I think some people do get into it just because it's good for the planet. Um, and I would say in our earliest years, some of the early adopters that we had very much fit into the sort of foundations with a mission and were willing to take a sacrifice on their returns. But I think that the majority of investors these days are looking for uh, financial returns and they make an economic calculation that there are risks related to climate and other uh, environmental uh, degradations that have to be hedged away. And there are enormous opportunities that they wanna have access to. Great, thank you. Uh, Nikki, we mentioned you're the CEO of the Windsor Group. Can you just expand on that a little bit? Tell us more about the Windsor Group and what you do. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so it's an impact fund, uh, not to similar in some ways to what John's focus is. Uh, and what we do is invest in projects uh, around the globe. Uh, and in particular, what we do is put over top of, we look at, at projects for the profitability, of course, but we also look at their environmental, social and governance uh, metrics as well. And to John's point, we don't see that there's a discordance between the environment and the economy. I think we see that as coming together and that there's profitability in taking that broader, uh, more holistic approach to investing. I mean, without a healthy planet, we don't really have a robust business case, do we? There you go. Andrew Pape Salmon is an adjunct professor at UVic, as we mentioned. Uh, Andrew, you deal as well with building safety codes and standards. I got to think that construction is moving pretty quickly toward greening themselves these days. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, well, first, a, a little pitch for um, <laughs> academic research, uh, which drives innovation. And it also um, enables our region to attract uh, some of the, the greatest minds from around the world um, to, to fuel our, our economy. Um, I've got a couple of uh, students coming in January. One's joining us from Tehran and the other one is from Boston. And so uh, you'll hear me time and time again today talk about uh, our brain power and our people and our knowledge as being a, a key economic driver. 
In terms of building codes and standards, I would suggest uh, the building stock, if you were to break the economy into three sectors, buildings, industry, transportation, buildings are the most advanced in all three with respect to decarbonization. Um, BC is a leader. Uh, you know, we've got some grassroots uh, economic activity with the, the Canadian Passive House Institute right here in, in Victoria, the National Institute that came over from Germany. Um, and we've got a, a unique uh, opt-in uh, energy step code where local governments can, can choose, can elect voluntarily through their bylaws uh, to adopt a higher standard than the, the BC and national code. And that is also driving innovation and supporting uh, decarbonization of the building stock for new construction. Our biggest challenge is existing buildings. And you'll hear me talk about that today. Yeah, and a refitting, a re retrofitting or refitting rather. We'll get to that later on. Thanks for that, Andrew. Uh, Jill Doucette with Synergy. So Jill, among the things that your organization and you do is that you do an assessment on workplaces like the chamber, for example, it's happened here, where you come in and help people better understand how they can be a bit more sustainable and earth friendly, is that correct? Yes, that's right. We work with a, a number of businesses um, and sectors. Uh, we were doing a lot of work in tourism and airports, so the conversation there has certainly changed, um, but it's great to see that sustainability really hasn't been backburnered as a topic. I think the focuses within sustainability have changed. Um, but uh, certainly I think it's going to be a growing movement. So glad to see it's part of the conversation today. Great, and that of course will keep popping up too. And Yamila Franco, uh, when we take a look at things that have been an issue for a long time, packaging and the way that products are presented to the market, there's a huge frontier that we need to cross in order to make advances in the development of products right now, isn't there? Absolutely, and you know, when I think about, even when it comes to investments or when it comes to how we handle products, I think we need to redefine the way that we think and look at products. Because realistically, sometimes when we might say that there's not a financial gain, it's because we're not taking into account the financial loss that we're experiencing just from the environmental degradation. I mean, look at Canada, where 86% of plastic waste ends up going to landfills. And this plastic, because it is only being used once, is nearly an $8 billion lost in Canadian dollars, and it's expected to increase to 11 billion by 2030. And that's just on the financial side. So um, kudos to Jill, who's here. I actually did a program with Jill, which is Project Zero Incubator. And that was a way of diving into the circular economy, which is what I'm going to be touching a bit more on today. OK, and I would have to think that the conversations about extracting energy from that kind of waste is also an opportunity for jobs and for the planet. Absolutely. Okay. I think that's going to come up again in this conversation. Uh, so just a little bit of housekeeping here. Uh, around the halfway mark in this conversation, we will be going to your questions and answers. If you could use the Q&A function to do that, please. Um, and also, uh, if you're going to chat and interact with the other attendees, use the Zoom format for that, the Zoom chat feature that's on here. Uh, the production team will monitor the Whova chat and the Q&A for those that are joining us through that app. And if you're posting any takeaways or anything on social media about this session or any others, please use the hashtag Hashtag Rising Economy Week 2020. All right. I want to ask a general question of everybody right now. We know that there will also, as well as opportunity, probably be a certain amount of reluctance or a will to return to the usual or the normal. In other words, take the easy way and just go back to the way we were doing things before all of this opportunity came along. How, how balanced can this shift or this pivot be right now, especially in convincing those who may not want to make the shift? And Nikki, I'll start with you on that. Sure, I think that's a good question. And, and you know, one of the things that we're, uh, you brought up plastics earlier, and the Windsor Group right now is looking at developing an ocean plastics platform, which is an opportunity really to bring together all three key things, which is, you know, people who are doing good work to create products that are made from ocean plastics, and companies that are reducing their, their dependence on plastics, uh, ocean bound plastics in particular, the many NGOs that are working together who are focused on ocean plastics. And this is particularly relevant right now because there has been, and I was on a call this morning about the circular uh, economy around ocean plastics. There has been a 1 trillion uh, percent increase in the amount of ocean plastics uh, since the COVID began in March. And that's because people are using masks, people are using gloves. And so finding what we're also though seeing is a shift uh, and more focus on innovation on 
other types of materials that can support those needs, which is we wanna make sure that people have access to masks, that they have access to PPE, but what other materials can we use? And so with this challenge that we're in with COVID, there's also the opportunity that people are really looking at this focus and saying, how can we do this a little bit differently? And um, John, I assume you're not seeing a lot of pushback from people, or maybe you are, but you're, you're in the business of presenting opportunities to people, right? Uh, yeah, early on, there was a lot of pushback. Um, you know, I'd, I'd worked most of my life in investment management, and I was amazed how I would say the majority of people that I talked to didn't kind of get it. I remember, uh, you know, a Victoria Connection 11 years ago meeting with Doug Pierce, who was the head of BCIMC at the time in Vancouver, actually, in one of their buildings in Vancouver. And he said, John, you're way too small for us to invest, but I'll give you a research contract. And so my, my comment on this would be kind of go where you can find the willing. And, and, and that, that meeting was really important to us at the time because I was then, and he told me I could, tell other institutional investors in Canada who were, who were primarily interested in, when it came to energy only in, our, in the fossil industry. Um, you know, so you go to where the willing are, are already in your camp on this stuff and don't try and get into arguments or convince those that aren't there. And my experience is that they come. You just, you just do a good job for them and, and then they come. And I think that's where we're at now. Great. Okay, Andrew, same thing over to you. Uh, we talked about some resistance being out there, but again, you work in the world that's more proactive in that sort of things, but do you see resistance anywhere? I think there is resistance in terms of uh, costs and benefits, the, the benefits being long-term, but I think the pandemic has shown us that, um, you know, hypothetical uh, risks and um, environmental risks public health risks actually translate to immediate financial implications when, when it finally hits. And so my, you know, even with COVID and existing buildings, for example, uh, there, there's, there's an emerging imperative to uh, renovate existing buildings with respect to a number of features and not, not the least of which is ventilation systems and bringing in fresh air to dilute um, you know, the potential for spread of virus. So, so that this has turned into an immediate imperative that may show up in the economic value of buildings in the near future. Um, so in terms of the green recovery, I think we're more sensitized and we're realizing that those future environmental risks uh, will translate to financial risks um, at some point. And there's a lot of literature. The uh, Insurance Bureau of Canada publishes the multipliers uh, that it, you know, it's one fifth of the cost to invest in mitigation now versus waiting for the disaster to occur and paying the damage costs. And, and yeah, you could say, well, insurance is covering it. But, but of course, that you know, insurance eventually shows, back, uh, shows up in our bottom line. Um, and then there's the big question about the survival of the insurance industry. Their largest claim in Canada in 20 years was the Fort McMurray wildfire, somewhere around $4 billion. You know, the Natural Resources Canada has estimated the cost of a, of a, a conceivable earthquake in, in Vancouver as being up, upwards of, you know, $70 billion and, um, depending on who you talk to. And, and so climate climate change uh, uh, has similar uh, future uh, damage cost uh, considerations. Mitigation today, investing today in green recovery uh, prepares us and it makes us more economically resilient. It was actually an announcement yesterday or a, a groundbreaking, if you will, for a project uh, on the edge of uh, Victoria for a company called Garrick, Mike Garrick Construction. Uh, they're doing a, a creation called Tressa, which is a double condo structure, um, wood-based. So it's a very green base. Take a look at that. If you haven't heard, just uh, it's spelled T-R-E-S-A-H. Any that are attending, uh, take a Google look at that, and you'll see what it's all about. Uh, Joe, I don't think you probably face a lot of resistance with what you do, but what do you hear? Um, well, actually, I was on a conference this morning with airports across North America, and uh, I thought, you know, this is going to be a real doom and gloom kind of conference because, um, you know, with airports and airlines across North America. But it was a great tone. They said, you know, 
they quoted Winston Churchill and said, don't let a good crisis go to waste. You know, this is our opportunity to, um, to really make these shifts we want to see in sustainable aviation fuels and to work on retraining our staff at airports about sustainability, integrate triple bottom line into our decision making. Um, and I was just a participant in this conference, but it was really, you know, so I wasn't telling them to say these things. No. Uh, so it was really great to to hear that kind of tone and i think that really speaks to you know if we can embrace that perspective right now as we design our recovery because that's really the phase we're in we're just we're designing what our future economy is going to look like will it be the same um and what areas will we change so i think it's a it's an incredible opportunity for for existing businesses to make these pivots and really future proof themselves and for new companies like Jamila's from um, from our incubator program to come in and fill voids that we didn't even know existed before. Yeah, it's kind of grim in the airport world right now, but certainly here at YYJ in Victoria, that this airport has been doing a great deal to uh, remediate the land around where they are, and they're looking at progressive ways to keep doing that. So, you know, there's a very strong sense of optimism there. Jamila, what are you hearing of any kind of pushback from you know, product people, uh, product creators, are they resistant to any of this? Or I think they're probably going to be pretty all over it. Yeah, so I was I was thinking about that as we were talking. And honestly, we've done such a strong uh, push to be aligned with the people that actually want to see this happening. And that's really where we found our niche in our space. And I think for any business, for any person that's watching this, I think that's what we have to do. Honestly, everybody who's in this call and, and watching this panel, and realistically, when we first started as, as a startup, we realized, you know, the values that we live by and this mentality of a rising economy, of a different way of managing our products and our systems, we had to find the specific group that was proposing that. So honestly, um, for example, we are working towards becoming a certified B Corporation, which is something I invite everybody to look at as well. Not everybody is aiming towards that. So in my case, it's not that I receive pushback, is that I don't see enough people moving in these spaces to actually bring the change that we need to see. And so like Jill was saying, what you realize is that financially, there's a whole stream of opportunities for investors, for business owners to actually change and re, uh, reframe the way products have been developed. And in our case, we started with one of the materials and products that were the hardest to recycle because of the toxicity, because of how it was made, and that, those were glow sticks. And that's how the Nyoka Light one came to be. It's the world's first earth-friendly glow stick. But, and right now, if you go to our website, you wouldn't find this out, but we've actually expanded our product offering. And we were looking at, you know, in the oceans, we have all this plastic, plastic waste. And so right now we're just switching one product, but how can we have a bigger impact? And we've now moving towards designing ways where we can retake and reclaim that plastic that's already out there and turn it into other viable products. So it's not just recycling for the sake of expanding the lifetime of a product and then throwing it out, but can we also reclaim and remediate the soil and the land we're on? And that's really been our approach in terms of, of looking at business differently. And I think it's something we need to start doing. It's not that it's cool to do it, but we have to. Yeah. So let's take all this home. Let's bring it home. Let's bring it to the South Island. Uh, and John, I'm going to begin with you. What are the opportunities here? on an investment side and in a successful side of building business, what are the particular opportunities for the South Island region to start greening and making a more sustainable economy? You started with me and I probably live the farthest away from the South Island of anybody. <laughs> on the... Well, you should just buy a house and move here. You know, can I uh, maybe maybe go in a different direction and tell you what I don't think you should be doing in okay, a way? Sure. I, th I, yep. think that, I think that every region, um, well, every region should focus on obviously where their strengths are. And I think they should try and figure out how to build the highest value uh, into the opportunities they have. So, I mean, Andrew can talk about building products and, and you just mentioned the building as an example, but you know, your region is so perfectly suited for the adoption of heat pumps and buildings and you know, building efficiency. And you're already ahead of parts of Canada in, in EVs and you could go even further with that. But, but you know, as a, as a global investor that looks at what's going on, one thing that kind of has seemed like a distraction and is, and I'm sure this is a bit political, but is this pelletization of wood and, you know, shipping pellets from BC. And I don't know whether this happens on the island, but shipping pellets from BC to, 
to you know, Northern England and to Japan, and then combusting them to create energy over there that is hugely polluting with this dream of carbon capture and storage maybe being built at the Drax plant right now in Northern England. Um, you know, I don't know what the figures are uh, that the BC government has supported that, but I think what is really important is to uh, make sure that when you do have economic development projects around the few industries where you really can specialize, you make sure that the green cred is really, is really strong. And so I don't, I'm not picking specifically on you because part of our job is to look at all these things that don't work in other parts of the world. But um, that's one to me from a distance that just the eye test doesn't make any sense at all. And let's say it's $30 million, whatever the figure is, that's money that's being misallocated away from something else that could be really strong in your area. So I'll leave it at that. I'm sorry to be a bit negative, but I, I, I was sort of eating at me. Okay, uh, where are you by the way, you're in Toronto? Yeah, I'm, I'm in Toronto, yeah. Is it snowing? No, uh, you know, just a little bit this morning. I didn't ride my bike this morning, but uh, I'll ride it tomorrow, 14 that's, on Friday. Okay, yeah. that's a, it's a little bit more snow than we have here. I mean, the other thing that we have here to our advantage in some cases is the climate, but that'll probably come up a little bit later on. Uh, Nikki, you're pretty uber local, you live here. Let's talk about some specific opportunities that you think we have in this region to move green. Well, perfect, yeah, thank you. Uh, one of the big ones, and you may have seen right now, the CRD has a solid waste management uh, plan out for consultation. And there is a great opportunity, um, instead of expanding the size of a landfill, actually coming up with alternatives to landfill. And uh, the Squimal, for example, right now is looking at gasification. Uh, you know, that's an opportunity to, to be able to really address uh, some of our, our waste issues at the same time to address climate action. So I think that's one great example. Uh, the Ocean Innovation Hub, and, and uh, this, this came up certainly through our recovery task force work, and it's something that uh, a group have really been focused on. We have a great opportunity to build off our location here close to the ocean. Uh, we have some great companies who are doing um, innovative work around ocean tech. And, and to really uh, use that uh, as a framework really to accelerate that, that sector. Uh, another is housing. And I think we're all aware, certainly if you live in, in Vancouver or in Victoria, uh, homelessness is a big issue here. Uh, and there's, it's a housing issue, it's a mental health issue. Uh, on the housing side, uh, we've heard from the province, we've heard from various municipalities that they're committed to making more investments in real housing, not just buying up old hotels. And when they make those investments, and this goes to Andrew's point, uh, that you know they can they can build housing that can also again uh, bring more green technologies into those those housing uh, buildings. The last is something Jill I know has worked on, which is the electrification of Ogden Point, and uh, and in fact you know, more broadly seeing more uh, EV around, um, around the South Island. We, uh, we certainly see it on the highways and on the roadways. Uh, so more charging stations, but really taking a hard look at our harbor particularly and saying, where can we do more work to bring in electrification there? So we're not only serving cruise ships when, in, when they come back, but also the fishing fleet that, that uses that harbor. Uh, and so, you know, Jill can probably speak to that with greater depth than I can. Uh, yeah, uh, Ogden Point is a good example. Uh, certainly the Navy base too, and the two shipyards, uh, Point Hope and uh, C-SPAN are both doing great things to try and green what they do as well. So Andrew, yeah, as Nikki said, Andrew, let's move into the building part with you too. How do you identify the, the immediate opportunity here? Thank you. Um, I've already alluded to the importance of renewing our existing building stock. Um, I guess one of the challenges with that is having enough labor and uh, professional capacity. You know, it's, it's a busy market right now. There's been a lot of do-it-yourself renovations during the pandemic. And then when we moved to the restart, uh, there were a lot of contractors hired. Um, and so I, I do think we, we need to consider uh, where our labor force is coming from and probably expand our labor force because our our people are our greatest asset in terms of creating wealth. And there was a question here about how can we influence uh, uh, places like China as you know, we're a leader on electric vehicles and, 
and zero carbon electricity, how do we influence China? I think it's, it's with our people. So I, I do believe a human resource strategy around green economy is, is key. Um, I wanted to highlight the potential for existing buildings. Um, you know, the, the Building Owners and Managers Association of BC has launched uh, Canada's second, uh, it's called the 2030 District, um, right here in Greater Victoria. Uh, we've got, uh, and I'm, I'm one of the co-founders of that initiative, uh, 3.6 million square feet of uh, floor area in a number of commercial uh, office, retail, institutional buildings among 10 property managers. And they've made a voluntary commitment to cut their energy use and greenhouse gas emissions by 50%, to, uh, to cut it in half uh, by the year 2030. So that will stimulate a lot of economic activity, provided we have the professional services and the, con and the construction labor uh, to respond to that demand. Uh, one of the buildings is Mayfair Center. Uh, Ivanhoe Cambridge is the property manager uh, or Mayfair Mall as we yes. otherwise know it. Um, they've recently done a, a major uh, addition and renovation. And, and we have found uh, through our analysis uh, at UVic uh, for, for them that they've cut their uh, energy use by 28%. So they're, they're almost at the, uh, the 35 percent target already, uh, which is for 2025, and cutting it in half by 2050. Sorry, 20. Did I say 28 percent? Um, yeah. So I think we should also build upon um, our university and and the brain trust that that can provide, and and bringing providing that magnet for some of the world's best thinkers into our region. And, uh, and looking at some potential uh, cluster development uh, from, our, from our universities. And I think the retrofit or renewal of existing buildings is a key area. I'll also put out this idea that, is there a possibility that we could attract a major uh, global manufacturing plant for, for green buildings in our region? And of course, we would have to do that in concert with, uh, with our colleagues uh, through the Pacific Northwest Economic Region. So uh, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, Alberta, uh, our market, uh, clearly our greater Victoria market's not large enough to attract that. We need to uh, work as a region to attract that kind of manufacturing. And there's a similar size city in Oregon that has attracted a, a global player in, in what's called heat recovery ventilators. So uh, obviously that requires uh, some market analysis. Um, I also, Cite uh, often the example of the Gas Bay region of Quebec. They, well over a decade ago, actually almost 20 years ago, they were able to attract wind turbine manufacturing capacity to their region from global uh, global providers and and using whatever available levers they have as a as a region, whether it be tax incentives, etc. Um, and and obviously the brain trust and and you know being able to provide employees. And so can we, can we replicate that? Can we replicate some of our other great success stories that already exist in our region around energy efficiency for buildings, including building controls? We have a global leader uh, right here in Greater Victoria um, that, that exports uh, the controls uh, globally. Uh, we also had another company in Central Saanich that was bought out by a French-based uh, multinational so can we learn from their experiences and, and replicate that? Thank you. Yeah, reliable controls is who you're talking about, right? Reliable controls and Schneider Electric, yeah. Schneider, yeah. Schneider has a connection with SIP and with the chamber. So that's great to know. Um, so uh, Jamila, when we talk about what, what uh, Andrew was just saying about the materials that are going into building, and again, you work in the world of material sciences and products, and, and is there an appetite and is there an opportunity for that to take more traction on the South Island? Where are you, by the way? What city are you in? I'm actually, so my headquarters are actually in Courtney in British oh, Columbia. Okay. I am connecting from Abbotsford okay. right now. So you're, so you're in the province, you know Courtney, you know the island. What yeah. do you see? What do you identify as opportunities for the, the stakeholders that you work with to do that greening in the South Island region? I'm going to bring a, a different answer, which maybe it's something that I realized we hadn't mentioned, but I feel there's a huge opportunity to advance reconciliation 
And oh, yeah. when that means when we're looking at the green recovery, uh, whether it is actually properly following protocol and engaging with the indigenous communities and actually learning from them and how they have managed their resources more traditionally. And also how can we turn that into something that can be scalable? And of course, again, it's not about capitalizing on their knowledge, but properly following protocol and understanding we can work together to rebuild this better. And acknowledging that there's been things that we've done in the past that hasn't been done the best way possible. But speaking on those materials, I see a huge, um, huge opportunities. I see that a lot in Alberta. We're actually uh, potentially starting to work more in Alberta as well as in BC. And especially when it comes to finding alternatives to dealing with plastic waste and with landfill waste without having to expand the landfills like Nikki mentioned, that's actually an area we are exploring as well. And we see people looking for, you know, maybe alternative solutions. And sometimes you find them in places that you didn't think about. I'll give you an example. All of our product packaging right now, we find a way to include biochar in our product packaging. And biochar, um, in case uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a way where when you treat your organic matter or even the land as well, you end up producing this byproduct, which is charcoal pretty much. But the way it is produced, it actually ends up capturing carbon. So it's carbon sequestering, meaning advancing climate action instead of releasing more greenhouse gas emissions into the environment. And when you throw it out, it can definitely just blend in with the environment, with the land and creates beneficial spaces for soil microorganisms. So again, it's taking maybe waste that we've created and turn it into something that can give back to the land and that actually builds that resilience, that environmental resilience. And so how do we learn? from things like that and how do we implement it in businesses? I think that's where innovators and, and we've in different ways of knowledge can come in play here. You know, I'm really glad that you brought up the indigenous part to that too. And the first nations in this region, of course, we can all learn so much by just listening and following their example. And uh, you know, it was the colonists that brought in the invasive species. They had water management under control before we came along. So there's a lot to learn from those nations. That's a, thank you for bringing that up. That's a great point. And Jill, you make the rounds in the South Island. You know what's going on out there and what's not. Where do you see the specific South Island opportunities? Oh, I, I see a lot of opportunity here on South Island. Um, I don't want to go on too long, but building on what <laughs> Andrew, <laughs> Andrew was saying about our brain power uh, and cluster development, I think that is a really good strategy because we tend to be... Um, less strategic about that. And I think SIP has really helped bring that kind of cluster perspective being something that is cross jurisdictional in our region. Um, but I think we could do a lot more in clusters and another cluster um, that we would like to work on is more related to hydrogen energy. So I think there's a lot of potential there. Uh, we have all of the sort of innovation capacity here. It's just about bringing these projects to fruition. Um, and of course, the circular economy, I've been talking about this for a couple of years now, and uh, Jamila's heard me talk about it too much. Uh, but I really think that, you know, we looked at the vital science report, Bruce, you and I this morning and saw that you know, our waste numbers are not where they need to be for us to be a sustainable community. And I think we can address those in more innovative ways, um, you know, having folks like the unbuilders deconstruct instead of demolish homes, um, looking at all of our waste streams and say, instead of shipping these to paying to get rid of these materials and shipping them overseas uh, where they don't even want them anymore um, what can we do here whether that is you know gasification maybe that is sort of one of the final stages for the waste that we really don't know what to do with but there's a lot of different products that still have a quite a bit of value if they can enter sort of a remanufacturing cycle, uh, such as creating plastic lumber, et cetera. So the opportunities are really endless. I think what we need to be leveraging is innovation and entrepreneurship and partnerships. And if we can kind of lean into those three during this recovery, then I think we'll come out stronger as a region than when we entered the pandemic. Great, thank you all for that. Great discussion. I'm gonna to go to some of the uh, questions that have been submitted. Question for John. John, what accounts for the unprecedented gains in the ESG market since the pandemic hit? And maybe just a little background uh, on, on Well, ESG yeah, let me, let me just uh, tell you what ESG is. ESG is a system of um, uh, measuring the behavior, the environmental, social, and governance behavior of companies. And uh, there's a lot of confusion between ESG and environmental investing because of the E and ESG. So just to be clear, 
uh, you could you can give an ESG score to uh, an oil producer like Suncor and one to CNQ, and one might use less water. I'm just going to make it really simple. Let's say Suncor uses less water than CNQ, so it gets a higher E in the ESG score. But you're still ending up with the oil companies and banks and pharma companies and so on. And so part of the attraction in the, in the broader investment world to ESG is that a lot of managers can integrate ESG and not really do anything differently than they've done in the past. So in the last couple of years, we've seen literally half the investment world suddenly become ESG managers, but no capital has been redirected. And I think this is very different from what uh, we do in a small handful of managers. And I know local manager like Shane Porter Leach at BCI, a thematic manager, they invest specifically in what companies produce and sell. So many of the, the things that we've talked about here today, the circular economy, you know, heat pumps, HRVs, uh, building materials, all these opportunities, that would be thematic investing. Um, and you're, you're, you're concentrating on companies that provide environmental solutions, which is totally different than ESG. And so just to circle back, why has ESG been so uh, growing so much? From the investment side, I think it's because in Wall Street and Bay Street, nobody has to do anything differently. And so it's super attractive. That's the cynical side of it. I'm not saying it's bad, but that's the cynical take. But uh, what really has not exploded to the same extent, and we need to be more purposeful in making sure it does, is purposeful investment in environmental solutions. And that's what's called environmental thematic investing. Hope that was helpful. Okay, triple bottom line is another way to put that, I suppose, right? Um, yes. Yeah, okay, anybody else wanna weigh in on that? Yes, uh, yeah. Bruce, I would, um, because I think I have a bit of a different take on it than John. Um, okay. Uh, I actually see the ESG metrics, first of all, they're more than just the environment. It's also looking at social, it's looking at governance. As I said earlier, it's, it's about taking a holistic approach. Um, I think that we often have characterized things in a very binary way. It's the economy, it's the environment. Uh, ESG provides a much more holistic way of looking at things. The way that we use that uh, metric is actually as an evaluative tool. It's a way to look and say, well, we wanna make sure that the investments are profitable, but we wanna also understand what is the impact of that investment and what that company is doing on the environment, on the community, and are they practicing good governance? And so that's the way that we use that metric. And I actually see it as quite powerful uh, my hope, uh, and certainly we are seeing an acceleration uh, of companies uh, that are adopting ESG principles in their evaluative tools, and I think that's a sign that um, the short-termism of just going after the profit by quarter for to satisfy uh, shareholder need, that that short-termism has got us into a lot of trouble, and we need to change the way we do business. And so they're looking for tools to help them make that change, to guide that change. Uh, and ESG is, is one of those sets of tools. Are they exclusive? No. Are they the best? Maybe, maybe not. I think uh, like we're seeing in so many other aspects right now, innovation's taking place and people are trying to understand how can we do this better? How can we for example, be more uh, mindful of our stewardship of the environment, not because uh, we want to greenwash our company, uh, be but because we're, we're getting it finally that there is an important link between protecting biodiversity and pandemics. And so it makes good business sense to start to take a better environmental approach to the way that we do our activities. Similarly, the pandemic has taught us that the social is critical. The only way that this pandemic response is working is because we are taking care of each other. We wear our masks, we, we change our behaviors, we social distance, and we're, we're building that based on a community, on, on a social commitment to each other. Again, I think companies are, are, are understanding the importance of, of that fabric and how that needs to be built in to the work that we're doing. And then finally, I mean, we only have to look down south to see why governance matters, right? I mean, we're seeing, uh, and Howard, Homer Dixon, who is uh, an academic here at Royal Roads, uh, has written a terrific book and he looks at 
some of the impacts that COVID and then Trump are having on our institutions. And the, the fragility that some of our democratic institutions uh, have that, that, we're, that are being exposed at this time. Uh, particularly down south, we're watching um, the fragility of, of the US democratic uh, institutions like the electoral system. And so it again reinforces that um, these are not activities or principles that are outside of business. They're necessary for business to be able to thrive and to recover. And so making those investments and putting that lens on your activity is not just a good thing to do, it's a smart thing to do. And actually, Nikki, somebody asked a question earlier, what's the difference between green and smart? Uh, it's kind of the same thing, I think. You know, South Island Prosperity was involved in the Smart Cities competition a while ago, huge environmental platform in that too. So thank you for that answer. Anybody else wanna weigh in before I ask the next question? Okay, so at this point, how about we come to the conversation about what could, I'm not gonna say should, what could government be doing to accelerate this pivot, to make it easier, to incentivize some sort of a change in consumer habits or even in product creation? Jamila, I'm gonna start with you on that one, please. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important one. I'm thinking of different solutions, but honestly, I feel that a lot of the, the way that, because we've been accessing government support, like we've been going in through the NRC IRAP and it's great when you're a research company and sort of like a clean tech company, we're very well positioned to access funding and other support. But I feel that we're actually, we might be able to find better solutions to these challenges if we weren't to places that, uh, or if we went to the unexpected places or to the unexpected businesses, maybe businesses that don't qualify for this funding or places um, that are not in the same clean tech uh, area. And the reason I say this is because we also need to look at this from an intersectional lens. Because when I'm making decisions and when I'm looking at creating technologies, I need to ask myself, how is this going to affect the environment? But how is this, uh, how is this going to create resilient ecosystems, which I think the environmental impact is easier. But like Nikki mentioned, we got to look at the social dimension of what we're creating as well. And so I think uh, something I would love to push for is to see some form of aspect or stream that is very much intended towards strengthening collaborations. And if you look at aligning our efforts with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, you have partnerships for advancing the goals. And when you break it down, you got different targets around that. But honestly, I feel that there has to be more of a collective culture that comes and that results from this. And part of that comes in saying, this is where you're working. How can I complement the work that you're doing and you complement my work? And as somebody had also asked about, you know, potential for partnerships and solving problems between BC and Alberta. And my response was, well, what partnerships can come from, you know, if, if Nyoka, for example, were to partner with a company that's in Alberta, because even though we have an understanding that is very much based on where we're at and it's a global understanding, et cetera, there is so much more power when we align ourselves and where we're working towards a, a cause. So it sounds simple like that. I just feel there has to be more alignment, more partnerships on that end. And then partly, I think a, a last thing I wanna share on the government side, I feel there has to be some form of entry point and some barriers that have to be redefined in how we include different groups that haven't been traditionally included in these spaces or conversations. Because again, I do wanna bring back reconciliation and working with indigenous communities as a key solution. Well. Last time I sat down with an indigenous founder and I was asking her, so why haven't you accessed funding? And the person told me, I just didn't feel like the funding organizations had the same values as my own. And I could completely relate to that. And I see that, but I'm lucky that I can speak both languages where I can go to an indigenous community and I can go back and, and submit a proposal to the government. And so I think we need to also reassess what, um, and that's a proposal on my end, but we assess what do we value and how we take in this information where it's not necessarily how we will want to receive it, but maybe how it has to be given in the points. Right. Thank you, Yamila. Uh, Andrew, I'm going to go to you for a couple of reasons right now. You have done work with Indigenous communities in the past, and you have had some knowledge of how government works. So what's what are the opportunities here? Yeah, I think where, where government intervention can can make a di big difference is around uh, alleviating uh, some risks or or helping helping the investment community and and the professional communities 
business communities uh, address risk. And one, one of the things is uh, governments can do is set, set a goal and strategy for where we're going. Um, and I guess uh, challenge uh, the free market to uh, have a long, a long view on um, investment um, and to, to incorporate uh, some future conditions and, and bringing evidence to the, uh, of those future conditions back to the decision maker such that when they, when they invest in a building or infrastructure, you know, we, Nikki brought up the, uh, the whole uh, sewage treatment issue um, that we've got the long view and we're aware of the risks around climate change. We're aware of the opportunities uh, around the changing global economy. So that's where governments can get involved and, and where there continues to be a persistent market barrier, um, uh, governments, of course, can intervene. And uh, you know, one of the most prevalent uh, barriers is, uh, is what I call the split incentive barrier, where one person's cost is another person's benefit. And, and so the, we don't move forward when those split incentives exist, whereas if government uh, helps to unify through the visioning and strategy development, helps to unify kind of where we're going, um, then those, those silos of decision-making that, that lead to split incentives can, can potentially align around that long view. Um, and so I guess uh, a good example I'll provide is a, what, what I call a technical roadmap. Um, and uh, the BC government uh, developed a, a technical roadmap for uh, essentially net zero energy buildings uh, by the year 2032. Uh, in fact, went out front from the national, federal government who had the same goal under the Pan-Canadian Framework for Clean Growth and Climate Change, but developed a technical roadmap in the BC Building Code. It's an optional code, and I've, I've referred to it earlier, that, that allows us all to align with kind of where are we going and so the, the developer can see where we're going and, and consider what, what will be the economic value of my building in the future or the building I'm designing and constructing in the future. And can I extract a higher sale price, so to speak, when I sell that, that building I just developed on the basis of alignment with those future conditions. So government, people generally take the government vision seriously and, uh, and that can help align. In terms of indigenous communities, I think it's threefold. One is um, um, the entrepreneurship is, is very strong in, in many communities. Um, the, the possibility for market housing on reserve is, is strong. I think people are aware of the, the, the proposed development beside the Broad Street Bridge in Vancouver on the Kitsilano Reserve with the Squamish First Nation. Um, and here in, in South Island, we've got uh, several uh, land areas. Land is at a, at a premium, like it, it, there's not enough land to meet our, our housing needs. We, we can densify, of course, but do we want South Island to have 60 story towers uh, like we see in Burnaby or, or um, do we want to broaden the scope of, of the land that we're using for, for housing development? Um, secondly, I think the cultural uh, side and um, making uh, housing and buildings more functional for the needs of, of people on South Island. I think there may be uh, more of an alignment uh, compared to the, the standard condo developer. If, if it's a First Nation developer, there's a potentially, and, and evidence shows a greater alignment with uh, the type of development meeting the needs of the people. I call that functional housing. And I think third is the labor force. And I've, I've gone to this before. Uh, we'd like to see a lot more indigenous people working in the professional community and in, in the construction industry. Um, and there are some pilot projects uh, uh, funded by government and other organizations. And I encourage the chamber to look at this is funding that kind of uh, training uh, to bring indigenous people into these, uh, these workforces uh, in, in short order, um, because we have, a, we have a labor shortage and there is an opportunity to, to employ and engage and, and build capacity.
Great. Thanks very much. So when we're talking about government putting money into things, they are investing in it, John Cook. You know investments. The return on an investment by a government is different than the return on an investment by a private investor. What's your perspective on that? Uh, well, governments are dealing with a lower cost of capital. So potentially they can find return on investing that, um, that the private market can't. But uh, these days, um, the cost of money is almost free for everybody. Right. So uh, starting from that, um, you know, I don't think that, you know, this, is, this has been debated forever, but I don't think governments are necessarily the best at making decisions around uh, where precious capital should be invested. I think they're better at showing direction and that can come through regulation. It can come through uh, soft touches like a price on carbon and so on, rather than picking, as I said earlier, like a, a pellet industry is something that they're going to back. There's all sorts of pressure for them to back certain types of industries and certain groups have better lobbying and whatnot, but they can definitely provide a direction. For five years of my life, I was ahead of a, a cluster sort of in Toronto, it was called the Mars Discovery District. And, um, uh, and I saw the power of governments actually investing in something that has the capability to leverage all the other um, uh, assets that you have in a community. So they weren't picking a specific you know, healthcare sector, a convergence of other sciences. They were saying, here's some infrastructure that can bring the best of what we have together. And somebody mentioned that that could happen in Victoria. And ever since that part of my life, I've been highly supportive of that. And in hindsight, uh, you know, their, their investments in Mars were nothing compared to all the benefits it's given our area. And, um, you know, the incredible assets that you have at the University of Victoria and the people there and, and the, um, the, a community that generally supports green and the environment. My goodness, if anywhere there should be an environmental clean tech cluster, it's in your, it's in your neighborhood. So that, yeah. that's, I think governments are better at direction than investment. And, um, you know, I understand that's politically charged, but that would be my, my opinion. Okay. Uh, Nikki, you have some extensive experience with government relations and with the system itself. So what, in, in your view, could government be doing to accelerate this? Well, and I think, you know, John has, has um, given a great example of Mars, which was a uh, framework and uh, infrastructure that really supported innovation. Uh, and, and again, it's more on the peer research side and the applied research side and there's always that divide that J Jamila has been able to get through from the research or applied research side to actually entrepreneurship into building a company uh, and government can play a really important role there which is helping get the companies get ideas um, over that divide get them into the market um, I always remind people when they're talking about government um, that it's not just about money. Government can provide so much more in terms of uh, access to a tremendous network. Um, so being able to help you find a marketplace, find uh, other investors, collaborators, others who are working in that to help you launch uh, it into that field. Um, government can also be, be really uh, quite good at validating your the approach that's being taken because either through using their procurement uh, practices which is to say that they purchase the service or product and help to nurture it so it becomes validated and then private sector is more likely to to adopt it if they've seen that government's already using it so there's a number of different ways that government can can use their power their levers uh, to really help support a shift, a better shift towards uh, a green recovery. Great, thank you. Uh, and the last word on this, Jill, is yours. You deal, I guess, mostly on a more of a, a local government basis, but what are the opportunities for all governments to do things here? Um, I don't have too much more to add. I'll keep it short. I think, um, you know, really the big thing is looking at where there are barriers and removing them. You know, simple things like, um, attack structures on on land to enable urban farms um, in the time that before they're being developed, for example, 
we have a different tax structure here in Victoria than we do in Vancouver with that regard. So there's just some best practices we can be implementing and just removing barriers to the things that we want to see in the city. So I'll I'll just leave it at that one because a lot's been argumented. Okay. Okay, thanks, Joel, very much. Uh, we are just about out of time. Uh, Yamila, you had one quick point you wanted to make. Can you do that in like 30 seconds? Yeah, thank you, uh, everybody, for sharing. But Nikki touched on government procurement, and that's something that really opened uh, up for us, but we couldn't do it alone. We've had mentors helping us. And if I didn't have mentors, we wouldn't be able to even understand government procurement. So that's a huge thing for de-risking the technology. And something I haven't seen yet is specific pathways for clean technologies. They're very much, you know, there's a challenge, there's a call, but how is the government going to call for something that hasn't been invented yet or a problem that they're not able to see? And so there has to be something that is purely for that innovation and to give that space for creativity. Mm -hmm.